Now, Rian was one of the kids that went to bed with his his um, his ball underneath his arm. You take the ball away, you want to cry. Do you know what I mean? And uh, my phone was going, and uh, it was Rian's mum saying to me, oh, someone wants to speak to you. Um, they're from Chelsea. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm up here watching cricket. So I'll just get his number, I'll ring him, and I'll get home, sort of thing. Sterling was there, and then we used to make a joke and say, oh, can you imagine Sterling and Rian on the other side? Do you know what I mean? Because people don't realise Rian was a winger. Why are you doing it? You're not, you're not doing it because daddy supports them, are you? Right? He said, no, dad, I just want to play football. I think it's 60-yard ball, and Rian come across his marker, brought it on his chest, and it swivelled in it the first time. Wow. That's when I went, wow. All of a sudden, my phone started ringing. People wanted interviews. It was like, Rian this, Rian that. But for me, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm living the dream. Not only is my son potentially playing for the team I support, but he's actually playing with, with, with people I've grown up with. Because a lot of people, <laughs> I'm going to make you laugh, a lot of people have made a big thing about when Rian um, went to the barbers and got his, uh, he had his medal around his neck. And he came come over to me and he said to me, listen, um, we don't need Rian to come here anymore. My heart sunk. What's up, everybody? You're very welcome along to this special Anfield Agenda interview. You're probably wondering who the gentleman beside me is. He is Ian Brewster, father of the phenomenal young Rian Brewster. Ian, how are you, sir? Hey, how you doing, Craig? You right? Not too bad, mate. I'm brilliant. And look, thank you so much, Ian, for taking the time to come on and have a chat with us about uh, a young footballer that may have moved to Sheffield United, but we still think as one of our own as Liverpool fans, and we're still looking out for him. And really appreciate you taking the time to come on and have a chat with us. Look, there's loads for us to get through, Ian, and I have hundreds of questions that I'd love to throw at you, my friend. But let's start off with a simple one. When did you know that Rian was an exceptional talent? When did you guys get the vibe that, hang on, he's no normal footballer here. We could have something special on our hands. Um, do you know what? Rian was playing football, like kicking the ball around since he was two or three years old. And uh, basically, a lot of people would say, oh, he's really good, really good. But, you know, being your, your child, you say, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. You know, doing the pleasantries and stuff. Even when I was a collective from nursery, I'd have mums and dads saying, oh, I watched your son kicking the ball around and he looked really good. So um, me and um, his mum said, look, we've got to do something about it. You know, too many people have told us. So we took him to um, a, a club called Shield Academy. Um, and he was playing um, with kids about two or three years older than him at the time. And uh, I went to watch him one evening um, in one of the school halls. And uh, the manager at the time, uh, Dan Seymour, his name was, is, should I say, and he came up to me and he, and he said, uh, I'll take you over Rian's dad. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, I need to speak to you. So the first thing I thought was, what's Rian done? So I said to him, like, what's he That's done? A parent. You? That's definitely a parent. Yeah, that is yeah. good, isn't it? Like, and, and, and he said, oh, I know you should like watch him. What do you think? I said, he's doing all right, but, you know, he needs to listen to you more. He seems to do his own thing. And he looked at me in amazement and he's like, and I said, what's the matter? And he said, uh, he's one of the best kids I've ever coached. You know, I work in a school. I went, really? I said, well, I'll tell you what, you've got him, do what you need to do. And and at that age, you're talking, he was a seven. He was seven. And when I saw a lot of proper coach telling me that, I then started to take note a little bit more. Because people sort of like ask me that question quite a bit. And, it, and it's really difficult to say, like, the, the exact point. Because as, as it's your child, you, you don't see it. You, you're, you're the, with their worst critic. You you look at them and say, yeah, you're okay, they're okay. You know, I could look at someone else's child and go, oh, yeah, he's really good, really good. But when it's your own, it's a bit difficult at the time. You don't tend to really believe it. But I would say when it, the age of seven and then when he started that season, you know, playing with the dad of season, that team and actually won their league. And he scored, oh, I think he scored about 30 goals. I think it was. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. yeah. He's mad. You know, he'd score every game. Um, and I suppose when you just watch the game, you'd hear the parents say, pass it to Ian, pass it to Ian. And that's obviously where you start to take a little bit note. And then you'd have parents talking to me and then, you know, people say, oh, you know, this club, that club. And you think, OK. So I'd say d d definitive answer probably around seven. Wow. Um, it mustn't have been too long then, if, if my timeline is correct, that he was playing for that club, scoring 30 in the season, and obviously came to the attention of Chelsea. And somehow, because if my memory is correct, I think Rian did go on to join Chelsea's academy around age seven. Yes, he did. Um, what happened is, um, that particular that year, when, when he joined Shield, they were doing a tournament, you know, like the summer tournaments they do. So that the season had actually hadn't started yet. So they're doing a tournament, and I, I wasn't there. 
um, his mother went in the end. And uh, at that tournament, uh, there was four clubs interested in him um, who saw him that day. And it was Arsenal, West Ham, Charlton and Chelsea. Now, when you do it, there's um, there's an etiquette. What you've got to do uh, if you're a member of the of a club is go to the coach and ask permission to speak to the parents. And the only club that did that properly uh, was Chelsea. They were like, came very professional. Now, the others, you know, it was a case of just giving your card over, saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're such and such a club, just come along sort of thing. Um, they didn't do it the right way. Now, for me, first impressions count. You know, if you approach me properly, I'll give you a chance. If you don't, I'll write you off. So we didn't really give the others a, a chance because they didn't come professionally the way they should have done. So um, basically, I was I was watching, funny enough, I was watching England and West Indies playing at Chester Street. And uh, my phone was going and uh, it was Rian's mum saying to me, oh, someone wants to speak to you. Um, they're from Chelsea. And I'm like, what? what are you talking about? I'm up here watching cricket. So I'll just get his number, I'll ring him and I'll get home sort of thing. And she's going, no, no, he wants to speak to you. So I spoke to him and he, he was telling me, oh, I'm like, my name's Martin. His name is Martin Taylor. Um, he said, I'm from Chelsea. I really do be interested, you know, him joining Chelsea. You know, your son's really good. I said, look, right, I've got your number. I said, we'll speak properly when I get home, like tomorrow sort of thing. And uh, we'll talk, you know, we'll talk properly. And he says, oh, yeah, I'll take him. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not about taking him training. I don't know who you are yet. I said, let's have a chat. So he said, okay. So um, he said, I think it started at six o'clock. I said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll turn up at half five and we'll have a chat before we decide anything. He said, yeah, fine, fine. So obviously that happened. In the meantime, I rang um, a couple of friends and that. One of them knew a gentleman by the name of Danny Bailey, um, who's an ex-professional. Um, he played for Orient, a few other clubs. And he happened to be a coach there. So they said, oh, we've, you know, Danny's a nice guy. He, you know, he would look after his son sort of thing. So when I got there, um, about half five, we had a chat. They took Rian away, you know, to uh, to training that. And that's when I started thinking, hold on, this is legit. <laughs> well, I'm seeing like Chelsea banners. <laughs> so uh, he took away training. I, I sat down, we had a chat. Um, Martin, some others, you know, explained what it's all about and that. So, okay. And then went back out, watched them train. Uh, when they finished, like Danny brought him over and he said, you know, if this is your little protege, you've got nothing to worry about. And even then it was sort of like, really? Okay, all right. You know, and uh, like I watched him train, it was all good. And we went a couple of times. Um, and then that was about two or three um, sessions there. Then it moved to a place called Dartford. And uh, that's the first time we met a gentleman by the name of Mike Bill. Um, who's obviously now Stephen Gerrard's right-hand man at Rangers. And when we went to Dartford, um, they did a big seminar, to, you know, with all the parents explaining what it's all about. And then I, I always remember after that session, he, he made a beeline for me and he came over to me and he said to me, listen, um, we don't need Rian to come here anymore. My heart sunk. I'm like, huh? That's a word, yeah, that's a word. Yeah, I went, mean, huh? Right, he went, he went, oh, no, he said, can you make Cobham on Saturdays? Now, Cobham's Chelsea's training. Yeah, but obviously I'm like, huh? Right. He said, can you make it Saturdays? Yeah. He said, he said, let me explain. Where Ian is at the moment, this is what you call like development, right? Satellite like, um, places. And what we do, the best ones are those, train at Cobham, and we call that the elite group. So I went, oh, he said, he's too advanced for where we are now. So he needs to train with the elite boys. I went, oh, I get you. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah. So we then started taking him down there. Um, and for about a year, a year or about six, seven months, I think it was, he was training with them. But I said to them, look, he's going to be starting football with his team. I don't. I want him to play with his friends. I don't want him to be playing like and just not getting used to playing with his friends. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, I realised he was too young to properly sign anyway. So they said, yeah, go ahead. You know, he could play his football with, you know, with Shield and that. And that's literally what happened. He played a season with them. And then when that season finished and, it was, and he was old enough, I think it was around the March, April time, right? When they turned, when he turned eight in April, they then had um, a signing at Chelsea. And that's when he, he signed the original, you know, the, the actual, not professional, the registration, should I say, for, for um, Chelsea. How proud a moment was that for you as a father? 
wow, I'll tell you what, I could believe it. That, I don't cry. I didn't cry, but there was a lump in my throat. Because it's, do you know what, Craig, it was the start of a journey. Because I always said to Rian, like, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a footballer. I said, OK. I said, you serious? He said, yeah. I said, OK. I said, well, at the end of the day, all I can do as a father is try and give you the platform. Daddy would do whatever he can to give you the platform. However, it's up to you to produce the goods. You know, if I put you there, you've got to do it. And he went, yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. And do you know what? When you see these documentaries about, like, prodigies and stuff for kids that, you know, like, you tend to find it, the running theme is they all love the game. They all wanted to do this. You know, Rian was one of the kids that went to bed with his, his, um, his ball underneath his arm. You take the ball away, you want to cry. Do you know what I mean? He would do extra. You know, you'd be sitting down, he'd be in the garden kicking the ball. It's like, it just did not stop. You know, it, it was football, football, football. And I, and I suppose the kids that really want it, they're the ones that really put that extra in. You know, and that's all I say to people. The kids have got to want to do it and enjoy it at the same time. You touched on Michael Beale there a moment ago. I just want to ask how big of a role that Michael Beale played in Reen's development during his time at Chelsea in particular. Mike Beale... First of all, let me say two things. What a lovely gentleman. And two, what an excellent coach. The guy's different gravy. There was a... <laughs> he, obviously, what age group did he have? I think he had the under-14s at the time. So when Rian was at, um, at, at Chelsea, we would finish our, our training session and then every week, you, know, you would stop, you'd walk past these training sessions and you'd literally watch what they were doing. So you like to see your Mason Mounts, Declan Rice's, your Eddie the Kids, all those who were a little bit older. Really. I used to see them when they were young, right? And some of the drills they were doing, you think, wow, do you know what I mean? And you'd look at it and you think, do you know what? I can't wait till Rian gets there. Michael, can you believe it or not, never actually got a chance to have Rian in his age group because he, he moved up an age group and then eventually then he left, right? However, there was other times when Rian would go during the week where he would take Rian and do other stuff. Not Rian, just Rian alone, the others. But to have him for a whole year just by himself, as in that age group, he never actually had Rian, uh, which that's, at the time, I thought, was, I thought it was a bit of regret because I really wanted to try and undermine. But um, when I used to see him and he used to do like bits of his Rian, he always used to give me like, you know, the, the SP of Rian and how well he's doing. And, uh, you know, he should do well, keep his feet on the ground. He's doing really well. And uh, when you're hearing it from someone like that, because you remember this guy's written books, you know, he's well, you know, he's well regarded in the Atlanta. He's a top, top, top coach. So, Rian joined Liverpool, I think, if I'm right, Ian, at the age of 14. But how did that move come about? And a little sneak preview for people here. Ian is also a massive Liverpool fan. I should probably have said that at the start. So, again, leaving Chelsea, excellent academy, excellent structure, fantastic club. But how did the move at 14 come about to Liverpool? Right. OK. Now, I had been looking at Rian's development at Chelsea, which he was doing really well. And um, what I'm going to say and make sure it's like on record is that for starters, Chelsea, right, the way they treated Rian, brilliant. Yeah. But, you know, I will not have a bad word said about Chelsea in that sense, the, the treatment that we had and, and got from them. Um, the reason why we left was not because of the way we were treated or anything like that, is at the time, it was more a case of Rian's development in the sense that of getting first team chances and so forth. You need to remember, when we first joined now, um, they took us all in, the parents, and told us what their vision was, a minimum to have at least one player for an academy a year to get through and so forth like that. Now, Rian had been there, what, six, seven years, and like everyone was still talking about John Terry. Do you know what I mean? It was like, you know, you know, at the time, there was, uh, when we first joined, the hope at the time, if I believe, yeah, it was uh, Josh McEachran. Funny enough, um, his brother, um, George, played with him. And, uh, like, Josh, lovely fella, you know, he was doing his thing. I think under Angelotti, he was really getting through. Then uh, Mourinho come along and the others, and I'm sure it was Mourinho, and uh, it didn't, get, didn't happen so much. But we were just looking, and I was thinking to myself, with someone like Josh, who gets a lot of airplay, a lot of, you know, People saying this, because I remember when he went to Swansea, people saying, oh, you know, um, this kid can, can find a pass, you know, from anywhere sort of thing. So, you know, he got a lot of praise. And I thought if the likes of him can't even get in the, the Chelsea first team, 
Rian's got no chance. So I was looking probably about two years prior. I was sort of like having little doubts on what's going to happen. And when it came to that point where I think it's like for the scholar and so forth, there's a little window you get where you can actually look around and sort of like, you know, because technically you haven't signed. And, um, you know, I, I was speaking to, uh, at the time, a friend of mine at the time um, who happened to be an agent and just said certain things about, you know, I'm not too sure about reinstating this sort of thing. And I'd always kept in contact uh, with Mike Bill as well. You know, he, he never he never said um, bring me in here and nothing like that. He, he wasn't that way. You know, he was very professional. Um, so we used to have like banter. And at the time it was uh, Sterling was there and then we used to make a joke and say, oh, can you imagine Sterling and Rian on the other side? Do you know what I mean? Because people don't realise Rian was a winger. Yeah, it was Liverpool that turned him into one of an out-and-out striker because he used to play on the right um, uh, at, at, at Chelsea. And we used to make banter and jokes and stuff like that. And um, as time went on, I sort of I said to him, I would, you know, I sort of like love him to come to Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? And he's really, I said, yeah, definitely. But um, obviously, when I speak to like the agent guy, put a few feelers out and so forth, and um, Liverpool, uh, you know, was one of them. And uh, conversations were made. You know, obviously, you spoke to Rian. Rian said yes. And I, and I, you know, before he, when he told me yes, I said, why are you doing it? You're not, you're not doing it because daddy supports them, are you? Right? He said, no, dad, I just want to play football. Do you know what I mean? So um, that's how that really come about. That's yeah, beautiful to hear. And you know what? You just want to play football. From our conversations that I've had with you, both on and off air, that's a team that keeps coming through with Reen and it will come through with any successful youngster like that. Is they're obsessed with the game. You talked about him going to bed with the ball. It's absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. And when he went to Liverpool and the move was made and he, he was up there, what was it like from a family perspective? Like Reen going all the way up, you're, you're based in London, Reen moving all the way up to Liverpool or did he commute up? What, what was it like when he made no, that transition? No, no. Right, basically, what, what was decided... At the time, um, with Rian's mum, I said, there's three choices. Either I move up there, you move up there, or it doesn't happen. This is when we more or less could see that like, we could go there. And uh, then it was decided um, that I would go up there. So I actually moved up there for five months when Rian first went up there. Uh, but a week before I actually moved up there, his mum arranged for him to live in digs. I was still up there, right, in the background sort of thing. You know, I spoke to him, see him every day and that. That was easy because I was around. Yeah, so he, he, he had that familiar face still around. He went to, when he went up there, he actually went to the parents that had Raheem Sterling. Do you know what I mean? He actually nice. went to those parents. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, um, no, they, 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 they were a nice couple. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he was doing all right there. And Korea, it's weird because Rian actually said to me, Dad, I've got no worries for you. You can make friends anywhere. Because he was more worried about me going up there by myself than him going up there. He just thought he's I'm going to play football. Do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, that, that was good. It wasn't too bad because of the fact that I was up there, so that helped. Um, I moved back down to London when his mother then moved up there. Part of his football and education at Liverpool, seeing him rub shoulders and train and, and practice with with some former legends of the club like Steve McManaman. And what was that like? What was that like as a parent? You're looking at your son out there on a pitch with somebody who you've idolised personally, Steve McManaman or Robbie Fowler or even Rushy, if you bumped into him walking around. It must be so surreal, just from, from your perspective. Do you know do you know what, Craig? It, it's weird because I'm more excited than he was. Like obviously he, he he's loving it and everything like that. But Obviously, like you said, these are legends. These are guys I've grown up like, oh, my God, Steve McManaman. And, like, he would come home and he would talk about, yeah, I did, you know, Steve. And I'm like, who's Steve? And he's like, I've seen McManaman, Dad. And he's, <laughs> but he's just talking like it's just a mate, you know? Um, you know, the respect was there, but, you know, he, he just did what he had to do. But for me, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm living the dream. Not only is my son potentially playing for the team I support, but he's actually playing with, with, with people I've grown up with. Do you know what I mean? And they're taking time out and you know, they're calling his name. They're, they're kicking the ball with him. You know, it, you, it, it's really hard to put it in words. It's just absolutely surreal. You know, it's brilliant at the end of the day. Looking at Rian then going through at Liverpool, progressing through the, the underage levels, were there any games or moments or, or victories that stood out for you where you thought, my son's absolutely nailed it here. He's had a blinder. There's a goal he scored. Oh, man, was it against Norwich? Oh, I've got it somewhere on my phone. He scored a banger. 
he got the ball up. I don't forget, I was behind him, like looking down the pitch. And uh, when he comes to him, you know the ones where you go, hit it, right? I think it took one touch and he went, bang, top bins, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, it was just, do you know, for me, it was just more development. You know, I, I think one of my favourite has to be, um, it, one of my favourite goals of his is when he scored in the under-23. There's two goals that stick out, and they were both volleys. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was one when, I think named Lloyd, I forgot his second name, he was centre-half, he, he, he moved on. And he, he uh, Lloyd Jones, no, if my yeah, correct. Yeah, I think it was. He pinged his 60-yard ball. And Rian come across his marker, brought it on his chest, and it swivelled in it the first time. Wow. That's when I went, wow. Yeah. And the other one was against, I'm sure you'd be happy as me, it was against Everton. Um, <laughs> nice. Right? Yeah. yeah. It was, um, the ball got pinged to Herbie, right? And Herbie cut into Herbie Kane, cut inside and, and pinged the ball over to the back post and Rian come in for the back. Followed it first time. Oh, different gravy. Different gravy. <laughs> What does it feel like as well? Again, sorry, I'm, I'm almost asking these as a fan and a parent, but what does it feel like to watch your son walk out in the Liverpool strip, just in the strip, man, with the shirt on, with that liver bird on his chest, being a massive red yourself? Well, do you know what? One of the first times I've seen him come out, people, not a lot of people, I think, remember this. People talk about his MK Dons game as his um, debut, which, yeah, it is, it's been the first team, but he actually played for the under-23s when he was 16. And not a lot of people remember this. He actually played against MK Dons, right? Mike Bill at the time was the manager. That's how long ago we're talking about. And he was doing well and he played. Like, he was sub and he'd come on. Within six minutes, he scored his goal. Six minutes. He, he ran through and he'd done the keeper with his eyes. Yeah? Like, put the, put the set the keeper down and put the other top bins. The other, right? Not a lot of people will know that. But... Obviously, I was in a stand and watching him try, like run up and down, and uh, I was like, "Wow!" But for me, my my biggest memory was when he, he did actually come on. He was a sub against Crystal Palace. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Um, he was seventeen, I believe, at the time, and he was warming up, and it was a chance he was going to come on. We actually lost that game, so I don't like talking about that. But <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, and he, I was, I remember he was in, I was in a stand, I was looking down, I videoed him, I was watching him, and I was like, and I was going to my mate, look at that, look at my son at Anfield, warming up, Liverpool. I said, it could get on it, and I was, I was talking high pitch voice, it could get on, it could get on. Do you know what I mean? He didn't, but that, that, that for me was the moment when I saw him in that kit at Anfield for the first time. I went, wow. Ian, we're at an age now, around sixteen or so, and I don't want to move your mind back to the World Cup. And not only did your son go over there and win a World Cup, not only was your son the top goal scorer in the World Cup, he also picked up uh, the bronze boot as well, I believe, with the bronze ball. What was that like? The hype around not just the rest of those young players, but Rian in particular, bagging a hat-trick at the, the quarters and semi-finals, if my memory is correct. Yeah, which right. is it's beyond um, ridiculous, Ian. It's, it's, yeah, it's not it's fair. Like, yeah. He's like he's like levelling up there, man. That's not fair. <laughs> what was that like to sit back and watch and have a whole nation suddenly discover your son and, and what he was about? Do you know what? It's a good question. It, it's weird. I, I'll build up to that. What happened? Um, sorry, England were actually one of the favourites. And I remember a lot of people, really? Right? But what a lot of people didn't realise, I knew for, for, for a little while now that the England setup had high hopes for that age group. You can see why. You look, you know the team now. Everyone knows about the team now, but I'm talking about before they really blew up, right? You know, I heard whispers that that was the one they were banking on. And they had a really good um, European Cup where they, they shouldn't have lost, but they did, um, against Spain. And uh, they played really well there. So they, had, they went into that knowing they had a very, very good chance to be up there. And I'm talking, I, I believe they, they felt they should at least get to the quarters stroke semis, yeah, they were that good. So when it started, um, we struggled a little. Um, you know, I think we missed a couple of chances and that, and uh, but they were still winning, but he was still working on. And Rian's done articles since then, and he said one thing he loved about Steve Cooper was he might not score at early doors, but he still gave him chances. He still said, "I know what you're about. Just just relax, just do your stuff," you know, and. 
people need to understand players need that. Yeah, players need that. You know, a little arm around them to know that you they've, you, they've still got your backing. And uh, I remember me and Rian had a conversation because I happened to be in America at the time, my best friend, and um, in Atlanta. So obviously, Rian would FaceTime or we would call each other and so forth. And I said to him, son, I think it's about time you, you join the party. I said, you know, come on, you're a goal scorer. I think it's about time. He went, I know that, I know, I know. That was when he scored a hat trick against uh, USA. <laughs> and my best mate said, Ian, I think he answered your question. I think he's joined the party. And uh, that, that, I was like, wow, 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 wow. That was that one. Then, when he did it against Brazil, and I'll be honest with you, I said, you know, I was thinking, oh, Brazil, you know, might be bitten off more than we can chew it. And uh, we played, and I think we scored at the right times. They missed a couple of guilt edge chances, and we capitalised. And uh, when he scored that hat trick, that third goal, when he, he wheeled round and then ran towards Steve Cooper, and sort of like was holding his shirt and stuff like that. Do you remember um, back in the day? Do you remember when Tardelli scored that goal? And he well, sort of like, like that's a mark. That's a that's one for us oldies. Yeah, <laughs> I'm showing the age here, and I yeah, right. Do you remember that that Tardelli moment when he was like, oh, and he's like, is he? He didn't know what to do. When I looked at Rian running towards Steve Cooper, I just thought of Tardelli, and he was like, we've done it, we've done it. And like when he scored that, and I was like, wow. Right, and uh, I just could not believe it when he scored that goal, and you know, obviously took the hat trick and that. So um, that was then, and then when it came to the final, it, it's really mad. When we were losing, like two nil, I, I was watching my best mate, and I said, "Do you know what? If we score a goal, I reckon we could get back in it. Do you know, I, I reckon we could do something." I said, "I know they're we're playing all right. I said, but we're not playing really bad. We're playing okay." And uh, obviously, we all know Rian scored that goal to just before half time, which I think is the best thing that happened. I think mentally, that's what done Spain because in other games they they used to capitulate when they went, you know, they struggled in the second half. And uh, when that went in, I thought, right, game on. And obviously, the rest is history. We went on and scored another four in the second half, five two. There you go. But um, it was it was surreal. It was absolutely surreal when. All of a sudden, my phone started ringing. People wanted interviews. It was like Rian this, Rian that, and like it, it was. It was a bit of a roller coaster. Do you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it was all about what he did. You know, Bowden, brilliant. You know, that, I was so proud of every single one of them. But obviously, you know, you got that little bit. You know, my son scored eight goals, so you got to be happy with that. Let's not like, let's not just gloss over this. Your son bagged a hat trick against Brazil. Against Brazil, there's not many people at any age group in their life in that are going to be able to look back and think my son bagged a hat trick against Brazil, and then was part of a team that won. There's not many English people in get to win a World Cup. Let's be frank about this, man. You know and even less you know of us what? Irish, of course. <laughs> that game against Brazil, do you know what? Because obviously I've had I've had chats with Ian about the World Cup and stuff, and I said to him, um, "Be honest, son. Like going into like, Brazil, what did you think?" Right? And he said, "He said, you know what, Dad? We had a team meeting." We were talking, and he said, "Our attitude was this." He said, uh, "We know what Brazil's about. They're a good team. You know, you you let them have the ball, they alert you." He said, "The way we felt we had to deal with them is they don't have the ball, right? They defend against us." And I tell you what, Craig, it was so refreshing. You remember, I've been brought up watching England playing Brazil, where Brazil just take the mick, yeah, and like would stand off them, yeah, and allow them to do what they've got to do, and blah blah blah. Right, and, and, and no one's brave enough to say, no, we're playing our football. This is what I tell people as well. The, the, the youth of today, their attitude, I love it. Absolutely love it. They don't care. They don't care about reputation. They don't care who you are, right? It's about me. We're going to show you what we can do. You know, um, that's why they play with that swagger. You know, your Foden's, you know, your, your, your um, Jaden Sancho's as well, your Callum hudson Doys as well. They express themselves, which is beautiful to see. You know, when you're hearing all the Germans now talking about, oh, we want the best English talent, who would have said that 10, 15 years ago? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, now, everyone, right, yeah. yeah, everyone's coming for our talent now, you know? So, so, so that was brilliant. So um, when he said that, I went, that's actually brilliant. You know, and I said to him, I said, what was your hardest game? Right over there. 
I thought he was going to say um, Brazil. He went, you won't believe it, Dad. I said, who's the hardest game? He went, Japan. I went, what? He said, Dad, they were fit, right? They were so organised. And he said, Dad, they gave me no space. He said, I had nothing to work with. He said, they were, he said, that's the one that went to penalties. He said, believe it or not, that was the hardest game we played all World Cup. It wasn't even Brazil. He said it was Japan. I went, wow. And these are little things, little nuggets of information. You think, oh, really? It's a jet that I'm telling you. Ian, after the World Cup and everything that came with that, the whole world's eyes were on Rian. And funnily enough, the way timelines go, he was approaching 17 or so then when he's able to sign his first pro contract. Unfortunately, as we sp spoke about off air, he picked up an injury. But Liverpool still wanted to, to get Rian to sign on, obviously because they thought really highly of him, as you can understand. But I imagine, and I, I'm not expecting you to give any information here that you're uncomfortable with, but I imagine there must have been so much interest in Rian. I mean, I've heard about interest from maybe Germany and other clubs. I remember Melissa Reddy, an excellent journalist at the time, uh, did a piece just letting us Liverpool fans know quite how many clubs around Europe were interested in Rian. And I remember as well when Mohamed Salah picked up his Player of the Season award, I remember Kloppo went out of his way to bring up Rian in, a, in his speech about Mohamed Salah. And that's the moment I just thought, the gaffer has faith here. This, this, the gaffer knows what we're all seeing. What was it like for you around that time and your son, of course, the pride of signing that first contract, but just that whole time? And, and also, is there any advice that you'd like to give to parents who may be in a similar situation? Because I remember an excellent show, you've probably seen it with Stephen Gerrard on BT, where he spoke about the pitfalls and some of the the less, I suppose, less uh, well thought of agents in the industry that are out there just trying to make a quick book and, and offering the sun, moon and stars to the young players and their families. I know that's a bit of a long-winded question, but, but please address it in any way you want. Right, yeah, you can remind me of, of all that question. In the minute. I'll try to remember every point. Um, right, first of all, um, with regards to around that time, um, unfortunately, as you know, like, Rian got injured. Um, I won't say he's prime because, you know, he's only 20, but when he was he was flying, he was flying at the time, you know. He's on a high from the World Cup, you know, that finished in October. He got injured in the January. You know, Klopp was all these making, you know, noises that, yeah, he's going to be involved. And then he got injured, which, you know, he was at 15 months, which totally set him back. But the thing for me was the fact that straight away Klopp got him involved in the first team set up. So he moved from Kirby up to Melwood. So every day he got his own physio, you know, and, and he's actually, you know, working with him, you know, to get him, you know, re rehabilitation. That was brilliant. Um, all the right noises with regards to you're still part of my plans and so forth like that. That, you know, for a young kid to be told that when, you know, he's lying down in bed and, you know, he's doing his, having to go do his weights every single day, thinking what's going to happen. I think personally helped him a lot. Um, from a family perspective, obviously he gave us, you know, um, a little bit of confidence, or, you know, uh, of what potentially could happen. You know, they're still wanting professional contracts and X, Y, and Z. Um, and yes, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. Yes, there was a lot of interest, but I suppose you expect that from what he did in the World Cup. Um, for, for Rian, it, it was all about football. It, it was like the Chelsea scenario. It was all about football, not money. Yeah, um, because, you know, if it's about money, there's other clubs you could have gone to. You know, um, Alex Inglethorpe brought in um, like little salary caps for academy players. Do you know what I mean? What I love about Liverpool is they pay on performance. So you start off on X amount, so to speak. And if you're really doing a the business, they rip up the contract, give you another one. Rip up. I love that. Yeah. Rather than giving someone a massive contract at a young age. And then it's like, oh, I've made it. No, you haven't really. Mate. You know, I've always said to Ian, you've only made it when you're one of the first names on that team sheet every week. So you've got the manager's trust and you're playing every week. So you're you're that first 11. Toughest game you're there, he's game, you know, you're playing all the time. That's when you start saying, I've made it. Not when you're flitting in and out sort of thing. So that's what I loved about Liverpool. It's like dangling that carrot and sort of like said, yeah, you know, you know, you do this, you do that. Yes, with regards to other clubs being interested, interested, yes, that's correct. Um, but ultimately... You know, Liverpool said the right things. You, you know, you need to understand at the time uh, that Rian, you know, we were thinking about signing or not sort of thing. You need to understand, you know, Danny Ings was there. Um, 
uh, Sturridge was there, obviously Rigi, and then you still got the front three as well. <laughs> Do you know, so that's a lot of people in front of Rian, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, you can't knock the guy, you know, the kid, should I say, because he wants to play football. Now, if it means he has to go elsewhere, then he has to go elsewhere. Not that he wants to, but, you know, he's got to look at his career. But, you know, the conversations I had, Liverpool assured that he was part of the plans, said the right noises and like the rest is history. You know, you know, he signed when he was 18, um, when he could have signed at 17. So he signed at 18, uh, May, May um, 2018 he signed. Um, so that was a lovely moment. Got to meet Klopp. God, he's tall. <laughs> you know, oh, I've, I've been in a room with him uh, at a press conference. And, you know, I didn't even get the courage to ask him a question. I was too in awe. Of Klopp, oh yeah, he's definitely a presence. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I can tell you, his charisma is exactly the same. He, what you see on telly is what you see in life, real life. You know, he's a lovely fella, beaming smile. You could tell he was proud to have obviously to have got me in. You know, we were proud as parents. You know, me, that was it. I've got pictures of me, Klopp, and Rian, and that. You know, they'll they'd be there forever. Do you know what I mean? So uh, it was actually brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, signing you at Melwood and stuff. And I just thought, wow, I've lived the dream. My son signed for my club. Do you know what I mean? I've been supported since, what, 1987, 88. So, um, and that was because of John Barnes, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, Love so, John Barnes. Oh, Love mate. Barnes. What a player. Oh, oh. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so, so when he signed there, it, it was just, that, that, that was the icing on the cake for me. You know, Rian had done it. And I said, Rian, this is where it starts now, you know. Um, with regards to agents and so forth like that, what advice would I give as a for a parent to another parent? Do your research, find out maybe who else they've got, ask questions, don't just go with the first one, compare. Another thing I always say, right? People get caught up with this when a, an agent comes and says, We can do this, we can do that, give them this, give them that, right? I'm old school, nothing comes free. Yeah, just remember, right? Whatever an agent gives you, they will take back. Yeah? And the way they'll take that back is 9 out of 10 through the contract that you're signing. They will make sure. Remember, they've got a kitty that they use to get your boots, try and buy you this, da, 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 da. do you know what I mean? They do it, right? So people think, oh, my God, you know, just be careful. Yeah? Because you don't get nothing for nothing. Now, you know, you're better off going with an agent who doesn't promise you that. That's just real. Another thing I would suggest, keep a professional. Don't have them too close. Yeah? So they, they're, they're the professional. Voice of reason, there's your family. So you've got the player in the middle. You've got the parents and all the good, their friends and, you know, close. And you've got the agent. It's like a triangle. Yeah? Don't have them too close. Just have them separate, I would say. So they're literally... Business only, best way, I believe. Um, but definitely do your research and uh, don't always believe everything that's said because football's a very small world. You'd be surprised at who knows who in football and uh, things that get said, things that, you know, people ask questions. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you get a lot of people um, doing their bits and pieces saying, yeah, we this, we're that. We're the... Okay. Proof's in the pudding, isn't it? Yeah, anyone can talk anything, so... That's what I'll definitely say. Um, don't have an agent too early. I'll be honest with you. The only reason we had an agent for Rian initially was the move from Chelsea to Liverpool. I'll be honest with you. If Rian was still at Chelsea, for argument, say, I wouldn't have had an agent. There's no need. Well, what do I need an agent for? Do you know what I mean? But th we just needed someone to finalise and know that, that, you know, you know what they say, um, dot the I's, cross the T's, when you're moving from such a big club to a big club. You know, to just do that by yourself without knowing how it works, you know, it's pretty scary. So that's the only reason we've got an agent initially. Otherwise, Rian wouldn't have had an agent at 14, to be honest with you. Ian, one of my favourite memories of Rian's, and uh, I'm going to ask you a serious question here, was was Rian with the scarf around his head, or the flag around his head? I think it was the scarf around his head with the Champions League medal around his neck. Now, my question to you, sir, is how long did it take before you were strolling around the house with that Champions League medal? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, right. The only time I saw that medal was because obviously I was at the, I was at the game. Um, like close, obviously family and friends, we were allowed to uh, 
uh, go to the game and so forth. You, you know, well looked after by Liverpool. So I must say thank you for that. Um, but that night, I see it, obviously, because um, after the game, um, they went, got changed, and then we went to a hotel where we saw the players, you know, um, obviously you select through because we had to have a special pass to get through. So I saw like some of the other players, like obviously Milner, Robertson, um, what's one of us spoke to, um, Henderson. But that that particular night, I, I got a picture of me holding the cup. Um, spoke to Jurgen, um, but that's the only time I actually had it really that that night. Since then, no, no, because a lot of people. <laughs> I'm gonna make you laugh. A lot of people have made. A big thing about when Rian um, went to the barbers and got his, uh, he had his medal around his neck. Ian, you know, I'm, um, I'm, look, I'm old school. I'd be full on flavour flay. I'd be going around with that medal everywhere, mate. I'm not going to lie to you. I'd be going <laughs> every toilet, bathroom, Tesco, doesn't he matter. I'd be having that medal on. Yeah, he did that. But a lot of people have taken it in the wrong way. Rian's doing it for a laugh and that. And uh, with regards to him, do you know, people say, oh, he didn't even kick a ball. Listen, the kid, right? was like 18 years old, yeah. He's um, at the Champions League final, right? He saw it as his mates winning it. And he just wanted to be part of that. Yes, he was part of the squad. He knows he didn't play. Don't you think there's a bit inside of Rian saying, you know what, I wish I'd... You know, of course it is. But at the end of the day, he's a team player, yeah? He, he saw it as his, his mates that he trains with every day yeah, that helped him through when he was in all of that, right, to be part of that, yeah? So all he did was rejoice it with them, yeah? So, yes, he's walking around his bed all week, just thinking, yeah, my team, my mates won it. That's what it's about. He's not thinking for one minute, I won it because I played, I did this. It's a lot of rubbish. But a lot of people have taken it as, oh, look at him going around with his medal around his neck, thinking he had done it. You know, it's not totally taken out of context, you know what I mean? But, hey. You know, you can't stop what people are thinking and saying. Yeah, that actually leads me nicely to something I wanted to talk to you about. And and let's go look at young Nico Williams recently as a good example for Liverpool. He broke through, lots of fanfare. And then like any young player, there's ups and downs. Sometimes the manager introduces them, they play a few games, the manager pulls them back out, they go into the under-23s. What's it like as a parent when you see nonsense being written about your child never mind the football stuff this is your child this is something you brought onto this planet seeing people who don't know anything about re and as you said he that were his mates the people that helped him through his recovery there's a family feel about liverpool that, that's what we all buy into that's what you'll never walk alone means it means something so what does it feel like when your son or any youngster you may be friends of yours as you said all the parents would have been close and players have gone up what does it feel like to see that nonsense about young players being written off after one poor game that's a great question um i'll be honest with you like anything football's about opinions yeah i've made a little pact with myself at the end of the day i watch football and i talk about a player whether i think he's good or bad so i have to expect the same career now being a parent I personally have no issues when people talk good or bad about Rian's playing ability. Yeah. Sometimes I question some of what they say in the sense that, well, actually, like when they say about, you know, um, he can't do what Salah could do on the right. Well, before you know, if you do your research, Rian used to play on the wing, he used to score goals for fun, Chelsea on the wing. Yeah, I know it's thingy football, but I'm talking about the mindset of what a winger needs to do. He, he, he knows all that. He could get chucked out on the left or right. He, he's done it before. So things like that, I think, yeah, whatever. Mate. But the only time that affects me per se is when people question him as a person, not anything to do with his football. That's when I take umbrage about it. And I've had to put somebody once in their place on Twitter um, about that. He started talking and putting out rubbish about, yeah, I've heard he's got an attitude problem and all this. And I basically said to him, really? Right? Uh, and he's the person sort of like, yeah, like, you know, like, who who you sort of thing. I didn't tell him I was his dad, but I think he realised by the end of it. And I said, you know what, I'll leave it there because obviously you know him better than me. And I think he worked it out and then he backed off. But I'm thinking to myself, don't talk about my son from a personal perspective because you don't know him. You don't know him, so don't comment on that. Yeah, Rian Brewster's rubbish. All right, happy days. You know, that's your opinion. Rian Brewster can't do this. Okay, fine, mate. Cool. Yeah, Rian Bruce has got an actual problem. 
I heard he's this. Yeah, always here. It's always I heard. It's never the person himself. I heard this. Like, Shut up. You don't know. He's not like that. I tell you, Rian is one of the best with kids, right? He has so much time because these are things I've instilled in him from when he was young. And, you know, because I remember I went up to meet him one time in Liverpool and uh, we were out in the pizza, pizza hut and someone like won his autograph for that. And that was one of the first times I'd experienced it, you know? And I laughed. I went, wow, oh, someone's asking my son for his, you know, for his signature. And, and he said to me, I said, are you all right with that? He said, yeah, daddy. He said, I don't mind. So I said, have you, like, this is normally at me. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, the biggest surprise for him, this is when he was younger, he said two blokes, like, asked him. Then when he's like, he's, he was about, I don't know, six or seven years, something like that. And they asked him, and he thought, oh, God, like, they've come to me. And, he, and they said, are you Rian Brewster? And he's like, yeah. And he went, oh, like, can we have your autograph? And he's like, oh, right, you know. So little things like that. So I've always taught him to be humble because I've said to him, look, when someone walks up to you and wants a picture with you or a signature or anything like that, right, whether you're having a bad day or not, give them that time because you need to understand they may never see you again. So that might be their only chance they've got to see you. So you've got to leave a lasting impression for them so when they walk away, they can say, yeah, I saw it re Brewster three years ago at such and such. And he was a really nice guy. He gave me an autograph and said, well done, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Move on, you know? And he went, yeah, you're right, Dad, you're right. So, I, you know, I remember once he said to me, he was in the restaurant with his mum and his sister and people come up and he, and he said to him, look, I don't mind. He said, but if you don't mind, let me just finish my food. You know what I mean? Then afterwards, I'll do whatever you want. Now, to me, that's fair. You know, and Rian's humble like that. He'll always help out, do whatever he needs to do, and he loves it. So, yeah, they're answering your question, like I said, once you question him as a person, that as a parent, that's hard to take. Yeah, and look, to any fans that may be watching this, always think about what you're right. I mean, it's easy on Twitter to dehuman, dehumanise somebody, but there's a human at the other end of that keyboard or the other end of that. So thank you for, for giving us that insight. So, Ian... We had Ray and Bruce breaking through, going, getting that Champions League medal. Then we had the loan move back with Steve Cooper, interestingly enough, at Swansea, where we really started to see Ray blossom into a man uh, and what he's capable of. What was it like for you watching him his time at Swansea? I'll tell you what, it was brilliant. Um, you know, talking to him and things he wrote, like he's done interviews since, he become a man, I would say, because... It's true what they say, under 20 football is under 23 football. I think when you, you, you're you playing under three, under 23 football at 16, that shows you you must be held in high regard. If you're playing it at 16, you must be doing something right. Yeah? However, I always fear for if you're still playing under 23 football when you're 21, yeah, that on, onwards, us ten, unless you're one of the first team coming back from injury, you're doing it. I always think to myself, mm, you need to start playing men's football, yeah, at that sort of time. So when he got a chance to go to um, Swansea, and obviously being with Steve Cooper, I think it was one of the best moves ever. Because you remember people, he was coming back from injury. He was trying a little bit with Liverpool. It wasn't really working out. He's still grand in his body, still trying to you know go through the rigours of, teaching your body, your mem muscle memory, what you need to be doing and the rigours of football. And the only way you could do that, you could do as much training as you want. You really need to be playing football. So when he went to Swansea and he started playing for a manager that trusted him, yeah, that was the first and foremost, trusted him. Um, and he started doing his thing. And I remember his first game, you remember he went now, and his first game, right, was against Cardiff away. Now, you couldn't get any bigger than that, could you? And fair play to Steve Cooper, right? He played him. Because everyone's going, oh, he might get on, you know, not the order. Played him, right? And I remember one of the defenders stuck one on him, right? But one of the commentators said, like, welcome to championship football. We got up, dusted himself off. Later on, got booked, <laughs> right? Because he, he stuck one on one of them, right? And I thought, that's what it's about. Because I've always taught him, don't let anyone take the mick out of you. Don't ever do that. Don't let him take the mick out of you. Right, so um, that was that. So, you know, he played that game. And then, obviously, he was doing quite well, um, playing, um, doing his thing. But one of the things he said that he learned from that was having to play, because in the championship, sometimes I took the games a week. Do you know what I mean? And that was hard. And he said there was times, 
he wanted to give up. Like, when I say give up, because it was hard physically. Because, you know, he's gone from all of a sudden trying to get back from injury and get a bit of training to playing men's football. So that was hard. And he, he learned how to deal with that. And then obviously had the lockdown. I think gave his body a little chance to recuperate. The rest is history. The run he went after that. But then this is another thing. You know, I, I believe Steve Cooper slightly um, changed the formation, right, to bring the best out of Rian and Ayu. And, you know, they nearly fired him into the uh, the premiership. And when you're a player and you've got a manager doing things like that, you think, OK, OK. And it got to the point, you know, every time Rian walked to the pitch, I think it was going It reminded me of watching him playing the youth football, where I was confident he'd he would score. He would score. He, he, he was in that vein, like, do you know what? Nothing's too hard for me. I'll do what I need to do. Um, so for me, in a nice summer case, he was he grew up, totally grew up, and I thought it was brilliant. Absolutely, the best thing that happened to him, and he put him back on the mat. I said to him at the time, I said, "You've now shown the football world what Rhea Brewster's about again, right? There's so much talk about it, you know, what you could do, da 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 da, but now you've shown them what you're about. You know what I mean? You don't muck about it. The goals are bang, it's it, and that's what he's about. He doesn't muck about." That obviously brought us through to the summer then and there was a lot of what's going to happen. Is he going to go? I think Leeds were mentioned at one point I remember reading yeah. about and there was a lot of what's going to happen with Rian and um, for whatever reason, and I don't want to touch on this because it's a very personal thing, he went and he signed with, with Sheffield United. There is a buyback clause in there from Liverpool's perspective, but I don't even want to ask you about what that was like because that's your own family business. I want to know what the future holds for Rian Bruce. So what, what's your hope for your sons the rest of his career? For me, first and foremost, me and you, me and Rian, we have steps. You know, we, there's no point in saying, oh, this and that, you know, so, and, 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 and you know, have the Jepses where it's just too far-fetched. Now, for me, right now, is to establish himself, right, in a team, find a home, yeah, where you're a regular. When you become a regular, you then start getting the experience you then start finding your levels. You then can start calling yourself an established premiership footballer. So for me, it's establishing himself as a professional footballer, as in at the level as a premiership player that he's at now. Now, the only way you're going to do that is by playing all the time. And of course, along the lines, I wouldn't score goals. That's just what we do. Yeah, well, that's what he does, should I say. You know, you know, for him to start scoring goals. Uh, from a personal perspective, in my mind, when he moved there, I turned around and said, I'd be happy if he scores 10 goals. That, that was the personal point, you know, 10 goals. If he scores 10 goals, happy days, you know, because obviously um, he, he's got to work his way up to that level. You know, this championship, now you're playing in the premiership. Championship, you might get five chances. Premiership, you might get one, two at the most, depending on how it, how the game goes. So for me, I'm looking at him establishing himself, um, finding his rhythm, um, speaking to him after the last game. You know, he, he said to me, he's feeling fitter. I personally think he looked fitter in the last game. Um, I saw things that I hadn't seen for a while, which I was happy with. Um, demanding the ball, coming out of the, the front line and coming in, so giving the ball and then driving forward. These are things I know Rian's got in his locker. Um, and, you know, I have a little conversation with him. I'll say to him, do your, do your thing, son. You know, I know what you're capable of. Forget about what everyone's talking about. Just do your thing. I know what you, I know what you can do. Yeah. So I said to him, that last game, that half hour you've done, you, you look good. I said, use that as a benchmark. You know, obviously I would expect more than that as time goes on, but use that as you don't go below that. Yeah? I said, you need to get to the point where you're the main man and people are, it's like, who plays with Rian? I said, but it will take time. But don't get your head down, which to be fair, do you know what? It hasn't. Um, he's still enjoying it. Um, and, you know, long may it continue, you know, you know, things are not going brilliantly. We know that. But at the end of the day, you've got to believe. You've got to believe. People don't understand the mental side of the game. You know, when I watched that last game and uh, Sooners was saying, he said, what's nice to see is you could tell the players are still playing for the manager. See, no one's down tools. And to me, that's when you, you know you're in a team. Yeah? Everyone, when you're winning everything and everyone's doing it, you know, it's easy to be a mate. It's easy to have. You know, but when you're down in the dumps, things are not going right, and you know it's by you know small margins, and you can walk off the pitch, and everyone's you know you lose the team, you win the team, X, Y, Z. 
I think that shows. <clears throat> and, you know, and Rian said to me, he said, Dad, I honestly feel we're, you know, we're that close to, to winning the game. And he says, when we do, I think that'll be it. That'll be it. It's just getting over that line. Well, I tell you what, Ian, I can see from chatting with you why Rian is the man he's become and what a grounded, lovely young man he is. And let him know from all of us, he may be at Sheffield United, but I'm being selfish. I hope I see him back at Liverpool Football Club. But wherever he ends up, all of us, every single one of us Reds, wish him the best and he'll always be one of our boys. So please pass on our love and best wishes to him. And Ian, thank you for giving people an insight into what it's like to be a father of, of such a talented young man. And uh, we wish him all the best moving forward. Really appreciate that, Craig. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That was Ian Brewster. And look, I know you're going to have lots of things you want to talk about. So please let us know in the comments section what you thought of this video. And again, thank you so much to Ian 